Lectures on Faith, prepared by the Prophet Joseph Smith, delivered to the School of the Prophets in Kirkland, Ohio, 1834-1835. through 1835. Explanatory Introduction The lectures were originally presented by Joseph Smith to the School of the Prophets in the early winter of 1834-1835. through 1835 in Kirtland, Ohio. See History of the Church, Volume 2, pages 169 through 170 and 180. These lectures are the most comprehensive inspired utterance that now exists in the English language, which defines, interprets, expounds, announces, and testifies what kind of being God is. They were written by the power of the Holy Ghost, by the spirit of inspiration. These lectures are eternal scripture. They are an essential part of the canon in Christ's church. The lectures were canonized in 1835 as the doctrine portion of the volume entitled Doctrine and Covenants of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, carefully selected from the revelations of God The lectures were included in the Doctrine and Covenants in consequence of their embracing the important doctrine of salvation and that the lectures together with the revelations that followed present our belief and when we say this humbly trust the faith and principles of this society as a body. See 1835 Doctrine and Covenants Preface. Accordingly, the church body accepted the committee's compilation on August 17, 1835 as the Doctrine and Covenants of their faith by a unanimous vote. History of the Church, Volume 2, page 243 and 246. A careful reading of these sacred scriptures is recommended to all who seek the face of God. It will be a guide to lead you back into His presence. Narrator's Note from Joseph Jensen As I desire to contribute to the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I pray you will receive this message with an open heart and with mercy for my narration, for I am far from a professional narrator. I hope these words can have as great an impact on building your faith as they have had on building my own. Lectures on Faith, Lecture 1 Faith being the first principle in revealed religion and the foundation of all righteousness necessarily claims the first place in a course of lectures which are designed to unfold to the understanding the doctrine of Jesus Christ. In presenting the subject of faith, we shall observe the following order. First, faith itself, what is it? Secondly, the object on which it rests, and thirdly, the effects which flow from it. Agreeably to this order, we have first to show what faith is. The author of the epistle to the Hebrews in the 11th chapter of that epistle and the first verse gives the following definition of the word faith. Now faith is the substance, assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, From this we learn that faith is the assurance which men have of the existence of things which they have not seen, and the principle of action in all intelligent beings. If men were duly to consider themselves and turn their thoughts and reflections to the operations of their own minds, they would readily discover that it is faith, and faith only, which is the moving cause of all action in them, that without it, both mind and body would be in a state of inactivity, and all their exertions would cease, both physical and mental. Were this class to go back and reflect upon the history of their lives from the period of their first recollection and ask themselves what principle excited them to action or what gave them energy and activity in all their lawful avocations, callings, and pursuits, What would be the answer? Would it not be that it was the assurance which we had of the existence of things 
which we had not seen as yet. Was it not the hope which you had in consequence of your belief in the existence of unseen things, which stimulated you to action and exertion in order to obtain them? Are you not dependent on your faith or belief for the acquisition of all knowledge, wisdom, and intelligence? Would you exert yourselves to obtain wisdom and intelligence unless you did believe that you could obtain them? Would you have ever sown if you had not believed that you would reap? Would you have ever planted if you had not believed that you would gather? Would you have ever asked unless you had believed you would receive? Would you have ever sought unless you had believed that you would have found? Or would you have ever knocked unless you had believed that it would have been opened unto you? In a word, is there anything you would have done, either physical or mental, if you had not previously believed? Are not all your exertions of every kind dependent on your faith? Or may we not ask, what have you or what do you possess which you have not obtained by reason of your faith? Your food? Your raiment? Your lodgings? Are they not all by reason of your faith? Reflect and ask yourselves if these things are not so. Turn your thoughts on your own minds and see if faith is not the moving cause of all action in yourselves. And if the moving cause in you is not in all other intelligent beings, and as faith is the moving cause of all action in temporal concerns, so it is in spiritual. For the Savior has said, And that truly, that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. See Mark chapter 16, verse 16. As we receive by faith all temporal blessings that we do receive, so we in like manner receive by faith all spiritual blessings that we do receive. But faith is not the only principle of action, but of power also in all intelligent beings, whether in heaven or on earth. Thus says the author of the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By this we understand that the principle of power which exists in the bosom of God, by which the worlds were framed, was faith, and that it is by reason of this principle of power, existing in the deity, that all created things exist, so that all things in heaven, on earth, or under the earth, exist by reason of faith, as it existed in him. Had it not been for the principle of faith, the world would never have been framed, neither would man have been formed of the dust. It is the principle by which Jehovah works, and through which he exercises power over all temporal, as well as eternal things. Take this principle or attribute, for it is an attribute, from the deity and he would cease to exist. Who cannot see that if God framed the worlds by faith, that it is by faith that he exercises power over them, and that faith is the principle of power, and that if the principle of power, it must be so in man as well as in the deity. This is the testimony of all the sacred writers and the lesson which they have been endeavoring to teach man. The Savior says in Matthew chapter 17, verses 19 through 20, in explaining the reason why the disciples could not cast out the devil, that it was because of their unbelief. For verily I say unto you, said he, if ye have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say to this mountain, Remove hence to go yonder place and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Moroni, while abridging and compiling the record of his fathers, has given us the following account of faith as the principle of power. He says in Ether 12, 13, that it was the faith of Alma and Amulek which caused the walls of the prison to be rent, as recorded in Alma 14, 23-29, 
It was the faith of Nephi and Lehi which caused a change to be wrought upon the hearts of the Lamanites when they were immersed with the Holy Spirit and with fire as seen in Helaman, chapter 5, 37 through 50, and that it was by faith that the mountain of Zaron was removed when the brother of Jared spake in the name of the Lord. See also Ether 12, 30. In addition to this, we are told in Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 32 through 35, that Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, David, Samuel, and the prophets, through faith, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, and that woman received their dead, raised to life again, etc. Also Joshua, in the sight of all Israel, bade the sun and moon to stand still, and it was done. See Joshua 10:12. We here understand that the sacred writers say that all those things were done by faith. It was by faith that the worlds were framed. God spake, chaos heard, and the worlds came into order. By reason of the faith there was in him, so with man also he spake by faith in the name of God, and the sun stood still, the moon obeyed, mountains removed, prisons fell, lions' mouths were closed, the human heart lost its enmity, fire its violence, armies their power, the sword its terror, and death its dominion, and all this by reason of faith which was in them. Had it not been for the faith which is in man, they might have spoken to the sun, the moon, the mountains, prisons, lions, the human heart, fire, armies, the sword, or death in vain. Faith, then, is the first great governing principle which has power, dominion, and authority over all things. By it they exist. By it they are upheld. By it they are changed, or by it they remain, agreeable to the will of God. Without it there is no power, and without power there could be no creation, nor existence. Questions and Answers on the Foregoing Principles What is theology? It is that revealed science which treats of the beginning and attributes of God, His relations to us, the dispensations of his providence, his will with respect to our actions, and his purposes with respect to our end. Buck's Theological Dictionary, page 582. What is the first principle in this revealed science? Faith. Why is faith the first principle in this revealed science? Because it is the foundation of all righteousness. Hebrews 11:6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. 1 John 3, 7 Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doth righteousness is righteousness, even as he, God, is righteous. What arrangement should be followed in presenting the subject of faith? First, it should be shown what faith is. Secondly, the object upon which it rests. And thirdly, the effects which flow from it. What is faith? It is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1 1. That is, it is the assurance we have of the existence of unseen things. And being the assurance which we have of the existence of unseen things must be the principle of action in all intelligent beings. Hebrews 11.3 through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed and by the word of God. How do you prove that faith is the principle of action in all intelligent beings? First, by duly considering the operations of my own mind, and secondly, by the direct declaration of Scripture. Hebrews 11, 7. 
By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of the things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Hebrews 11, 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. Hebrews 11, 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Hebrews 11, 27. By faith, Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, as seeing him who is invisible. Is not faith the principle of action in spiritual things as well as in temporal? It is. How do you prove it? Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Romans 4, 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To that end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Is faith anything else beside the principle of action? It is. What is it? It is the principle of power also. How do you prove it? First, it is the principle of power in the deity as well as in man. Hebrews 11.3 Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Secondly, it is the principle of power in man also. Book of Mormon, page 264. Alma and Amulek are delivered from prison. Page 421. Ephi and Lehi with the Lamanites are immersed with the Spirit. Page 565. The mountain Zurin, by the faith of the brother of Jared, is removed. Joshua 10:12. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. Joshua 10.13 And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hastened not to go down about a whole day. Matthew 17, 19. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? Matthew 17, 20. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Hebrews 11.32 And the following verses. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, and of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. How would you define faith in its most unlimited sense? It is the first great governing principle which has power, dominion, 
and authority over all things. How do you convey to the understanding more clearly that faith is the first great governing principle which has power, dominion, and authority over all things? By it they exist, by it they are upheld, by it they are changed, or by it they remain, agreeable to the will of God, and without it there is no power, and without power there could be no creation nor existence. Lectures on Faith, Second Lecture Having shown in our previous lecture, faith itself, what it is, we shall proceed to show, secondly, the object on which it rests. We here observe that God is the only supreme governor, an independent being in whom all fullness and perfection dwell, who is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omnisentient, without beginning of days or end of life, in that in him every good gift, every good principle dwell, and that he is the father of lights. In him the principle of faith dwells independently, and he is the object in whom the faith of all other rational and accountable beings center for life and salvation. In order to present this part of the subject in a clear and conspicuous point of light, it is necessary to go back and show the evidences which mankind have had and the foundation on which these evidences are, or were based since the creation, to believe in the existence of God. We do not mean those evidences which are manifested by the works of creation, which we daily behold with our natural eyes. We are sensible that after a revelation of Jesus Christ, the works of creation throughout their vast forms and varieties clearly exhibit His eternal power and Godhead. Romans 1, verse 20, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. But we mean those evidences by which the first thoughts were suggested to the minds of men that there was a God who created all things. We shall now proceed to examine the situation of man at his first creation. Moses, the historian, has given us the following account of him in the first chapter of the book of Genesis. Beginning with the 20th verse and closing with the 30th, we copy from the new translation. And the Lord God said unto the only begotten, who was with him from the beginning, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and it was done. And the Lord God said, Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of the only begotten created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And the Lord God said unto man, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed, to you it shall bring forth meat. Again, Genesis chapter 2 15 through 17, 19 through 20. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, neither shalt thou touch it. Nevertheless, you may choose for yourself, for it is given unto you, but remember that I forbid it. For in the day that thou eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, and every fowl of the air, and commanded they should be brought unto Adam, to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, 
and to every beast of the field. From the foregoing, we learn man's situation at his first creation, the knowledge with which he was endowed, and the high and exalted station in which he was placed, Lord or Governor of all things on earth, and at the same time enjoying communion and intercourse with his Maker, without a veil to separate between. We shall next proceed to examine the account given of his fall and of his being driven out of the Garden of Eden and from the presence of the Lord. Moses proceeds, And they, Adam and Eve, heard the voice of the Lord God as they were walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou going? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I beheld that I was naked, and I hid myself. And the Lord God said unto him, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I told you thou should not eat? If so, you should surely die. And the man said, The woman whom thou gave me, and commanded that she should remain with me, gave me of the fruit of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this which thou have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And again the Lord said unto the woman, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In sorrow you shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. And the Lord God said unto man, Because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the fruit of the tree which I have commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed shall be the ground for your sake, and sorrow you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns also, and thistles shall it bring forth unto you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. By the sweat of your face shall you eat bread until you shall return unto the ground, for you shall surely die, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. This was immediately followed by the fulfillment of what we previously said, man was driven or sent out of Eden. Two important items are shown from the former quotations. First, after man was created, he was not left without intelligence or understanding to wander in darkness and spend an existence in ignorance and doubt. On the great important point which affected his happiness as to the real fact by whom he was created or unto whom he was amendable for his conduct. God conversed with him face to face. In his presence he was permitted to stand and from his own mouth he was permitted to receive instruction. He heard his voice, walked before him, and gazed upon his glory, while intelligence burst upon his understanding and enabled him to give names to the vast assemblage of his Maker's works. Secondly, we have seen that though man did transgress, his transgression did not deprive him of the previous knowledge with which he was endowed relative to the existence and glory of his creator. For no sooner did he hear his voice than he sought to hide himself from his presence. Having shown then in the first instance that God began to converse with mankind, immediately after he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and that he did not cease to manifest himself unto him even after his fall, we shall next proceed to show that though he was cast out from the Garden of Eden, his knowledge of the existence of God was not lost. Neither did God cease to manifest his will unto him. We next proceed to present the account of the direct revelation which mankind received after he was cast out of Eden and further copy from the new translation. After Adam had been driven out of the garden, he began to till the earth and to have dominion over all the beasts of the field, and to eat his bread by the sweat of his brow, as I, the Lord, had commanded him. 
and he called upon the name of the Lord, and so did Eve his wife also. And they heard the voice of the Lord from the way toward the Garden of Eden, speaking unto them, and they saw him not, for they were shut out from his presence. But he gave unto them commandments that they should worship the Lord their God, and should offer the firstlings of their flocks for an offering unto the Lord, and Adam was obedient unto the commandment. And after many days an angel of the Lord appeared unto Adam, saying, Why do you offer sacrifices unto the Lord? And Adam said unto him, I know not, save the Lord commanded me. And the angel said unto him, This thing is a similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father, who is full of grace and truth. And you shall do all that you do in the name of the Son. And you shall repent and call upon God in his name forever. In that day the Holy Spirit fell upon Adam and bore record of the Father and the Son. This last quotation or summary shows this important fact that though our first parents were driven out of the Garden of Eden and were even separated from the presence of God by a veil, they still retained a knowledge of his existence and that sufficiently to move them to call upon him. And further, that no sooner was the plan of redemption revealed to man and he began to call upon God, then the Holy Spirit was given, bearing record of the Father and the Son. Moses also gives us an account in the fourth of Genesis of the transgression of Cain and the righteousness of Abel and of the revelations of God to them. He says, In process of time Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Now Satan knew this, and it pleased him. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door, and Satan desires to have you. And except you shall hearken unto my commandments, I will deliver you up, and it shall be unto you according to his desire. And Cain went into the field and talked with his brother Abel. And while they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and slew him. And Cain gloried in what he had done, saying, I am free. Surely the flocks of my brother will now fall into my hands. But the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And now you shall be cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, she shall not henceforth yield unto you her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond also, you shall be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, Satan tempted me because of my brother's flocks. And I was also angry, for his offering was accepted, and mine was not. My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me out this day from the face of men, and from your face shall I be hid also. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass, everyone that finds me will slay me because of my oath, for these things are not hid from the Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whoever slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. The object of the foregoing quotations is to show to this class the way by which mankind were first made acquainted with the existence of a God, that it was by the manifestation of God to man and that God continued after man's transgression to manifest himself to him and his posterity, and notwithstanding they were separated from his immediate presence that they could not see his face, they continued to hear his voice. 
Adam, thus being made acquainted with God his Father, communicated the knowledge which he had unto his posterity. And it was through this means that the thought was first suggested to their minds that there was a God, which laid the foundation for the exercise of their faith, through which they could obtain a knowledge of his character and also of his glory. Not only was there a manifestation made unto Adam of the existence of a God, but Moses informs us, as before quoted, that God condescended to talk with Cain after his great transgression in slaying his brother, and that Cain knew that it was the Lord that was talking with him, so that when he was driven out from the presence of his brethren, he carried with him the knowledge of the existence of a God. And through this means, doubtless his posterity became acquainted with the fact that such a being existed. From this, we can see that the whole human family in the early age of their existence and all their different branches had this knowledge disseminated among them so that the existence of God became the object of faith. In the early age of the world and the evidence which these men had of the existence of a God was the testimony of their fathers in the first instance. The reason why we have been thus particular on this part of our subject is that this class may see by what means it was that God became an object of faith among men after the fall, and what it was that stirred up the faith of multitudes to fill after him, to search after a knowledge of his character, perfections, and attributes, until they became extensively acquainted with him, and not only communion with him, and behold his glory, but be partakers of his power and stand in his presence. Let this class mark particularly that the testimony which these men had of the existence of a God was the testimony of man, for previous to the time that any of Adam's posterity had obtained a manifestation of God to themselves, Adam, their common father, had testified unto them of the existence of God, and of his eternal power and Godhead. For instance, Abel, before he received the assurance from heaven that his offerings were acceptable unto God, had received the important information of his father that such a being did exist, who had created and who did uphold all things. Neither can there be a doubt existing on the mind of any person that Adam was the first who did communicate the knowledge of the existence of a God to his posterity, and that the whole faith of the world from that time down to the present is, in a certain degree, dependent on the knowledge first communicated to them by their common progenitor, and it has been handed down to the day and generation in which we live. As we shall show from the face of the sacred records, First Adam was 130 years old when Seth was born, Genesis 5.3. And the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were 800 years, making him 930 years old when he died, Genesis 5.4-5. Seth was 105 when Enos was born, verse 6. Enos was 90 when Canaan was born, verse 9, Canaan was 70 when Mahalalil was born, verse 12, Mahalalil was 65 when Jared was born, verse 15, Jared was 162 when Enoch was born, verse 18, Enoch was 65 when Methuselah was born, verse 21, Methuselah was 187 when Lamech was born. Verse 25, Lamech was 182 when Noah was born. Verse 28, from this account it appears that Lamech, the ninth from Adam, the father of Noah, was 56 years old when Adam died. Methuselah, 243, Enoch, 308, Jared, 470, Mahalalil, 535, Canaan, 605, Enos, 695, and Seth, 800 years old. So, 
that Lamech, the father of Noah, Methuselah, Enoch, Jared, Mahalalel, Canaan, Enos, Seth, and Adam were all living at the same time, and beyond all controversy, were all preachers of righteousness. Moses further informs us that Seth lived after he begat Enos 807 years, making him 912 years old at his death. Genesis 5, 7 through 8. And Enos lived after he begat Canaan 815 years, making him 905 years old when he died. Verses 10 through 11. And Canaan lived after he begat Mehalalel. 840 years, making him 910 years old at his death, verses 13 and 14. And Mahalalel lived after he begat Jared 830 years, making him 895 years old when he died, verses 16 and 17. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years, making him 962 years old at his death verses 19 and 20. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years, making him 365 years old when he was translated, verses 22 and 23. And Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech 782 years, making him 969 years old when he died, verses 26 through 27. Lamech lived after he begat Noah 595 years, making him 777 years old when he died, verses 30 and 31. Agreeable to this account, Adam died in the 930th year of the world. Enoch was translated in the 987th. Seth died in the 1042nd year. Enos in the 1140th. Canaan and the 1235th, Mahalalel in the 1290th, Jared in the 1422nd, Lamech in the 1651st year, Methuselah in the 1656th, it being the same year in which the flood came. So that Noah was 84 years old when Enos died, 176 when Canaan died, 234 when Mehalalil died, 366 when Jared died, 595 when Lamech died, and 600 when Methuselah died. We can see from this that Enos, Canaan, Mehalalil, Jared, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah all lived on the earth at the same time, and that Enos, Canaan, Mehalalil, Jared, Methuselah and Lamech were all acquainted with both Adam and Noah. From the foregoing, it is easily to be seen not only how the knowledge of God came into the world, but upon what principle it was preserved, that from the time it was first communicated, it was retained in the minds of righteous men, who taught not only their own posterity, but the world, so that there was no need of a new revelation to man. After Adam's creation to Noah, to give them the first idea or notion of the existence of a God, and not only of a God, but of the true and living God, having traced the chronology of the world from Adam to Noah, we will now trace it from Noah to Abraham. Noah was 502 years old when Shem was born. Ninety-eight years afterwards, the flood came, being the 600th year of Noah's age. And Moses informs us that Noah lived after the flood 350 years, making him 950 years old when he died. Genesis 9, 28 through 29. Shem was 100 years old when Arphaxed was born. Genesis 11, 10. Arphaxed was 35 when Salah was born, 11 and 12. Salah was 30 when Eber was born, chapter 11, 14. Eber was 34 when Peleg was born, in whose days the earth was divided, chapter 11, 16. Peleg was 30 when Ru was born, 
chapter 11, 18. Ru was 32 when Shurug was born, 11, 20. Shurug was 30 when Nahor was born, 11, 22. Nahor was 29 when Terah was born, 11, 24. Terah was 70 when Haran and Abraham were born, 11, 26. There is some difficulty in the account given by Moses of Abraham's birth. Some have supposed that Abraham was not born until Terah was 130 years old. This conclusion is drawn from a variety of scriptures, which are not to our purposes at present to quote. Neither is it a matter of any consequence to us whether Abraham was born when Terah was 70 years old or 130 years old. But in order that there may no doubt exist upon any mind in relation to the object lying immediately before us, in presenting the present chronology, we will date the birth of Abraham at the latest period, that is, when Terah was 130 years old. It appears from this account that from the flood to the birth of Abraham was 352 years. Moses informs us that Shem lived after he begat Arphaxad 500 years. This added to 100 years, which was his age when Arphaxad was born, making him 600 years old when he died. Arphaxad lived after he begat Salah 403 years, 1113. This added to 35 years, which was his age when Salah was born, makes him 438 years old when he died. Salah lived after he begat Eber 403 years, 1115. This added to 30 years, which was his age when Eber was born, makes him 433 years old when he died. Eber lived after he begat Peleg 430 years, 1117. This added to 34 years, which was his age when Peleg was born, makes him 464 years old. Peleg lived after he begat Ru 209 years, 1119. This added to 30 years, which was his age when Ru was born, makes him 239 years old when he died. Ru lived after he begat Surig 207 years, 1121. This added to 32 years, which was his age when Surig was born, makes him 239 years old when he died. Surig lived after he begat Nahor 200 years, 1123. This added to 30 years, which was his age when Nahor was born, makes him 230 years old when he died. Nahor lived after he begat Terah 119 years, 1125. This added to 29 years, which was his age when Terah was born, makes him 148 years old when he died. Terah was 130 years old when Abraham was born and is supposed to have lived 75 years after his birth, making him 205 years old when he died. Agreeable to this last account, Peleg died in the 1996th year of the world, Nahor in the 1997th, and Noah in the 2006th. So that Peleg in those days the earth was divided, and Nahor, the grandfather of Abraham, both died before Noah, the former being 239 years old, and the latter 148. And who cannot but see that they must have had a long and intimate acquaintance with Noah. Ru died in the 2026th year of the world, Surag in the 2049th, and Tara in the 2083rd, Arphaxad in the 2096th, Sela in the 2126th, Shem in the 2158th, Abraham in the 2183rd, and Eber in the 2187th, which was four years after Abraham's death, and Eber was the fourth from Noah. Nahor, Abraham's brother, was 58 years old when Noah died. Terah, 
128, Sereg, 187, Rue, 219, Eber, 283, Sela, 313, Arfaxid, 344, and Shem, 448. It appears from this account that Nahor, brother of Abraham, Terah, Nahor, Sereg, Ru, Peleg, Eber, Selah, Arphaxad, Shem, and Noah all lived on the earth at the same time, and that Abraham was 18 years old when Ru died, 41 when Sereg and his brother Nahor died, 75 when Terah died, 88 when Arphaxad died, 118 when Selah died, 150 when Shem died, and that Eber lived four years after Abraham's death, and that Shem, Arphaxad, Selah, Eber, Ru, Tureg, Terah, and Nahor, the brother of Abraham, and Abraham lived at the same time, and that Nahor, brother of Abraham, Terah, Sureg, Ru, Eber, Selah, Arphaxad, and Shem were all acquainted with both Noah and Abraham. We have now traced the chronology of the world agreeable to the count given in our present Bible from Adam to Abraham and have clearly determined beyond the power of controversy that there was no difficulty in preserving the knowledge of God in the world from the creation of Adam and the manifestation made to his immediate descendants. As set forth in the former part of this lecture, so that the students in this class need not have any doubt resting on their minds on this subject, for they can easily see that it is impossible for it to be otherwise. But for the knowledge of the existence of a God must have continued from father to son as a matter of tradition at least, for we cannot suppose that a knowledge of this important fact could have existed in the minds of any of the before mentioned individuals without their having made it known to their posterity. We have now shown how it was that the first thought ever existed in the mind of any individual that there was such a being as a God who had created and did uphold all things, that it was by reason of the manifestation which he first made to our father Adam when he stood in his presence and conversed with him face to face at the time of his creation. Let us here observe that after any portion of the human family are made acquainted with the important fact that there is a God who has created and does uphold all things, the extent of their knowledge respecting his character and glory all depend on their diligence and faithfulness in seeking after him. Until like Enoch, the brother of Jared and Moses, they shall obtain faith in God and power with him to behold him face to face. We have now clearly set forth how it is and how it was that God became an object of faith for rational beings and also upon the foundation the testimony was based, which excited the inquiry and diligent search of the ancient saints to seek after and obtain a knowledge of the glory of God. And we have seen that it was human testimony and human testimony only that excited his inquiry in the first instance in their minds. It was the credence they gave to the testimony of their fathers. This testimony, having aroused their minds to inquire after the knowledge of God, the inquiry frequently terminated, indeed always terminated, when rightly pursued, in the most glorious discoveries and eternal certainty. Questions and Answers on the Foregoing Principles Is there a being who has faith in himself independently? There is. Who is it? It is God. How do you prove that God has faith in himself independently? Because he is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omnisentient without beginning of days or end of life, and in him all fullness dwells. Ephesians 1, 23 Which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Colossians 
1.19 For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Is he the object in whom the faith of all other rational and accountable beings center for life and salvation? He is. How do you prove it? Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Romans 11, 34 through 36. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given unto him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Isaiah 40, from the ninth to the eighteenth verses. O Zion, that bringest good tidings, or, or thou that tellest good tidings to Zion, get thee up unto the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings, or, O thou that tellest good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the city of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand or against the strong, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him, or recompense for his work. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighted the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor hath taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and shewed him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket, and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing, and vanity. Jeremiah 51, 15 through 16. He, the Lord, hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom, and hath stretched out the heaven by his understanding. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain, and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 But to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. How did men first come to the knowledge of the existence of a God? So as to exercise faith in him, in order to answer this question, it will be necessary to go back and examine man at his creation, the circumstances in which he was placed, and the knowledge which he had of God. First. When man was created, he stood in the presence of God, Genesis 1, 27, 28. From this we learn that man at his creation stood in the presence of God and had most perfect knowledge of his existence. Secondly, God conversed with him after his transgression, Genesis 3, from the 8th to the 22nd. From this we learn that though man did transgress, he was not deprived from the previous knowledge which he had of the existence of God. Thirdly, 
God conversed with man after he cast him out of the garden. Fourthly, God also conversed with Cain after he had slain Abel. Genesis 4, from the fourth to the sixth. What is the object of the foregoing quotation? It is that it may be clearly seen how it was that the first thoughts were suggested to the minds of men of the existence of God and how extensively this knowledge was spread among the immediate descendants of Adam. What testimony had the immediate descendants of Adam? In proof, the existence of God, the testimony of their father, and after they were made acquainted with his existence by the testimony of their father, they were dependent upon the exercise of their own faith for a knowledge of his character, perfections, and attributes. Had any other of the human family besides Adam a knowledge of the existence of God? In the first instance, by any other means than human testimony? They had not. For previous to the time that they could have power to obtain a manifestation for themselves, the all-important fact had been communicated to them by their common father. And so, from father to child, the knowledge was communicated as extensively as the knowledge of his existence was known. For it was by this means, in the first instance, that men had a knowledge of his existence. How do you know that the knowledge of the existence of God was communicated in this manner throughout the different ages of the world? By the chronology obtained through the revelations of God. How would you divide that chronology in order to convey it to the understanding clearly? Into two parts. First, by embracing that period of the world from Adam to Noah, and secondly, from Noah to Abraham, from which period the knowledge of the existence of God has been so general that it is a matter of no dispute in what matter the idea of his existence have been retained in the world. How many noted righteous men lived from Adam to Noah? Nine, which includes Abel, who was slain by his brother. What are their names? Abel, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, and Lamech. How old was Adam when Seth was born? 130 years. How many years did Adam live after Seth was born? 800. How old was Adam when he died? 930 years. How old was Seth when Enos was born? 105 years. How old was Enos when Canaan was born? 90 years. How old was Canaan when Mahalalel was born? 70 years. How old was Mahalalel when Jared was born? 65 years. How old was Jared when Enoch was born? 162 years. How old was Enoch when Methuselah was born? 65 years. How old was Methuselah when Lamech was born? 187 years. How old was Lamech when Noah was born? 182 years. For this chronology, see Lecture 2, 37. How many years, according to this account, was it from Adam to Noah? 1,056 years. How old was Lamech when Adam died? Lamech, the ninth from Adam, including Abel, the father of Noah, was 56 years old when Adam died. How old was Methuselah? 243 years. How old was Enoch? 308 years. How old was Jared? 470 years. How old was Mahalalel? 535 years. How old was Canaan? 605 years. How old was Enos? 695 years. How old was Seth? 800 years. For this item of the account, see Lecture 238. How many of these noted men were contemporary with Adam? Nine. What are their names? Abel, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalel, 
Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, and Lamech. How long did Seth live after Enos was born? 807 years. What was Seth's age when he died? 912 years. How long did Enos live after Canaan was born? 815 years. What was Enos's age when he died? 905 years. How long did Canaan live after Mahalalel was born? 840 years. What was Canaan's age when he died? 910 years. How long did Mahalalel live after Jared was born? 830 years. What was Mahalalel's age when he died? 895 years. How long did Jared live after Enoch was born? 800 years. What was Jared's age when he died? 962 years. How long did Enoch walk with God after Methuselah was born? 300 years. What was Enoch's age when he was translated? 365 years. How long did Methuselah live after Lamech was born? 782 years. What was Methuselah's age when he died? 969 years. How long did Lamech live after Noah was born? 595 years. What was Lamech's age when he died? 777 years. For the account of the last item, see Lecture 240. In what year of the world did Adam die? In the 930th. In what year was Enoch translated? In the 987th. In what year did Seth die? In 1042nd. In what year did Enos die? In the 1140th. In what year did Canaan die? In the 1235th. In what year did Mahalalel die? In the 1290th. In what year did Jared die? In the 1422nd. In what year did Lamech die? In the 1651st. In what year did Methuselah die? In the 1656th. For this account, see Lecture 241. How old was Noah when Enos died? 84 years. How old when Canaan died? 179 years. How old when Mahalalel died? 234 years. How old when Jared died? 366 years. How old when Lamech died? 595 years. How old when Methuselah died? 600 years. See Lecture 242. How many of those men lived in the days of Noah? Six. What are their names? Enos, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Methuselah, and Lamech. How many of those men were contemporary with Adam and Noah both? Six. What are their names? Enos, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Methuselah, and Lamech. According to the foregoing account, how was the knowledge of the existence of God first suggested to the minds of men? By the manifestation made to our father Adam when he was in the presence of God, both before and while he was in Eden. How was the knowledge of the existence of God disseminated among the inhabitants of the world? By tradition from father to son. How old was Noah when Shem was born? 502 years. What was the term of years from the birth of Shem to the flood? 98. What was the term of years that Noah lived after the flood? 350. What was Noah's age when he died? 950 years. What was Shem's age when Arphaxed was born? 100 years. What was Arphaxed's age when Selah was born? 35 years. 
what was Selah's age when Eber was born? Thirty years. What was Eber's age when Peleg was born? Thirty-four years. What was Peleg's age when Ru was born? Thirty years. What was Ru's age when Shireg was born? Thirty-two years. What was Shireg's age when Nahor was born? Thirty years. What was Nahor's age when Terah was born? Twenty-nine years. What was Terah's age when Nahor, the father of Abraham, was born? Seventy years. What was Terah's age when Abraham was born? Some suppose 130 years, and others 70. What was the number of years from the flood to the birth of Abraham, supposing Abraham to have been born when Terah was 130 years old? It was 352 years, but if he was born when Terah was 70 years old, it was 292 years. How long did Shem live after Arphaxed was born? 500 years. What was Shem's age when he died? 600 years. What number of years did Arphaxed live after Selah was born? 403 years. What was Arphaxed's age when he died? 438 years. What number of years did Selah live after Eber was born? 403 years. What was Selah's age when he died? 433 years. What number of years did Eber live after Peleg was born? 430 years. What was Eber's age when he died? 464 years. What number of years did Peleg live after Ru was born? 209 years. What was Peleg's age when he died? 239 years. What number of years did Ru live after Shurig was born? 207 years. What was Ru's age when he died? 239 years. What number of years did Surig live after Nahor was born? 200 years. What was Surig's age when he died? 230 years. What number of years did Nahor live after Terah was born? 119 years. What was Nahor's age when he died? 148 years. What number of years did Terah live after Abraham was born? Supposing Terah to have been 130 years old when Abraham was born, he lived 75 years. But if Abraham was born when Terah was 70 years old, he lived 135. What was Terah's age when he died? 205 years. For this account, from the birth of our facts said to the death of Terah, see Lecture 2, 48. In what year of the world did Peleg die? Agreeable to the foregoing chronology, he died in the 1996th year of the world. In what year of the world did Nahor die? In the 1997th. In what year of the world did Noah die? In the 2006th. In what year of the world did Ru die? In the 2026th. In what year of the world did Surig die? In the 2049th. In what year of the world did Terra die? In the 2083rd. In what year of the world did Arphaxed die? In the 2096th. In what year of the world did Sela die? In the 2126th. In what year of the world did Abraham die? In the 2183rd. In what year of the world did Eber die? In the 2187th. For this account of the year of the world in which those men died, see Lecture 2, 49 and 50. How old was Nahor, Abraham's brother, when Noah died? 58 years. How old was Terah? 128. 
How old was Sarug? 187. How old was Ru? 219. How old was Eber? 283. How old was Selah? 313. How old was Arphaxed? 348. How old was Shem? 448. For the last account, see Lecture 251. How old was Abraham when Ru died? 18 years. If he was born when Terah was 130 years old. What was his age when Surig and Nahor, Abraham's brother, died? 41 years. What was his age when Terah died? 75 years. What was his age when Arphaxed died? 88. What was his age when Selah died? 118 years. What was his age when Shem died? 150 years. For this, see Lecture 252. How many noted characters lived from Noah to Abraham? 10. What are their names? Shem, Arphaxed, Selah, Eber, Peleg, Ru, Serug, Nahor, Terah, and Nahor, Abraham's brother. How many of these were contemporary with Noah? The whole. How many with Abraham? Eight. What are their names? Nahor, Abraham's brother, Terah, Serug, Ru, Eber, Selah, Arphaxed, and Shem. How many are contemporary with both Noah and Abraham? 8. What are their names? Shem, Arphaxed, Selah, Eber, Ru, Thurig, Terah, and Nahor, Abraham's brother. Did any of these men die before Noah? They did. Who were they? Peleg. In whose days the earth was divided? And Nahor, Abraham's grandfather. Did any one of them live longer than Abraham? There was one. Who was he? Eber, the fourth from Noah. In whose days was the earth divided? In the days of Peleg. Where have we the account given that the earth was divided in the days of Peleg? Genesis 10.25 Can you repeat the sentence? Unto Eber were born two sons, the name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. What testimony have men, in the first instance, that there is a God? Human testimony, and the human testimony only. What excited the ancient saints to seek diligently after a knowledge of the glory of God, His perfections and attributes, the credence they gave to the testimony of their fathers? How do men obtain a knowledge of the glory of God, his perfections and attributes? By devoting themselves to his service through prayer and supplication, incessantly strengthening their faith in him, until like Enoch, the brother of Jared, and Moses, they obtain a manifestation of God to themselves. Is the knowledge of the existence of God a matter of mere tradition? founded upon human testimony alone? Until persons receive a manifestation of God to themselves, it is. How do you prove it? From the whole of the first and second lectures. Lectures on Faith, Third Lecture In the second lecture, it was shown how it was that the knowledge of the existence of God came into the world and by what means the first thoughts were suggested to the minds of men that such a being did actually exist, and that it was by reason of the knowledge of his existence that there was a foundation laid for the exercise of faith in him, as the only being in whom faith could center for life and salvation. For faith could not center on a being of whose existence we have no idea, because the idea of his existence in the first instance is essential to the exercise of faith in him. Romans 10:14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? 
or one sent to tell them. So then, faith comes by hearing the word of God. Let us here observe that three things are necessary in order that any rational and intelligent being may exercise faith in God unto life and salvation. First, the idea that he actually exists. Secondly, a correct idea of his character, perfections, and attributes. Thirdly, an actual knowledge that the course of life which he is pursuing is according to his will. For without an acquaintance with these three important facts, the faith of every rational being must be imperfect and unproductive. But with this understanding, it can become perfect and fruitful, abounding in righteousness, and unto the praise and glory of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Having previously been made acquainted with the way the idea of his existence came into the world, as well as the fact of his existence, we shall proceed to examine his character, perfections, and attributes. In order that this class may see not only the just grounds which they have for the exercise of faith in him for life and salvation, but the reasons that all the world also, as far as the idea of his existence extends, may have to exercise faith in him, the Father of all living. As we have been indebted to a revelation which God made of himself to his creatures, in the first instance, for the idea of his existence, so in like manner we are indebted to the revelations which he has given to us for a correct understanding of his character, perfections, and attributes, because without the revelations which he has given unto us, no man by searching could find out God. Job 11, 7 through 9, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 11. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even to the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Having said so much, we proceed to examine the character which the revelations have given of God. Moses gives us the following account in Exodus, chapter 34, 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Psalm 103, 6 through 8. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. Psalm 103, 17 through 18. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto the children's children to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Psalm 92. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Hebrews 1, 10 through 12. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands, and they shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, thy years shall not fail. James 1.17 Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Malachi 3, 6. 
For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Book of Commandments, chapter 2, commencing in the third line of the first paragraph. For God doth not walk in crooked paths, neither doth he turn to the right hand nor the left, neither doth it vary from that which he hath said. Therefore his paths are straight, and his course is one eternal round. Book of Commandments, chapter 37, verse 1. Listen to the voice of the Lord your God, even Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, whose course is one eternal round, and the same today as yesterday and forever. Numbers 23, 19 God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. 1 John 4, 8 He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Acts 10, 34-35 Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no specter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. From the foregoing testimonies we learn the following things respecting the character of God. First, that he was God before the world was created and the same God that he was after it was created. Secondly, that he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abundant in goodness, and that he was so from everlasting and will be to everlasting. Thirdly, that he changes not, neither is there variableness with him, but that he is the same from everlasting to everlasting, being the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that his course is one eternal round without variation. Fourthly, that he is a God of truth and cannot lie. Fifthly, that he is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that fears God and works righteousness is accepted of him. Sixthly, that he is love. An acquaintance with these attributes in the divine character is essentially necessary in order that the faith of any rational being can center in him for life and salvation. For if he did not, in the first instance, believe him to be God, that is, the creator and upholder of all things, he could not center his faith in him for life and salvation. For fear, there would be greater than he who would thwart all his plans, and he, like the gods of the heathen, would be unable to fulfill his promises, but seeing he is God over all, from everlasting to everlasting, the creator and upholder of all things, no such fear can exist in the minds of those who put their trust in him, so that in this respect their faith can be without wavering. But secondly, unless he was merciful and gracious, slow to anger, long-suffering, and full of goodness, such is the weakness of human nature, and so great the frailties and imperfections of man, that unless they believed that these excellencies existed in the divine character, the faith necessary to salvation could not exist, for doubt would take the place of faith, and those who know their weakness and liability to sin would be in constant doubt of salvation if it were not for the idea which they have on the excellency of the character of God, and that he is slow to anger, long-suffering, and of a forgiving disposition, and does forgive iniquity, transgression, and sin. An idea of these facts does away doubt and makes faith exceedingly strong. But it is equally as necessary that men should have the idea that he is a God who changes not, in order to have faith in him, as it is to have the idea that he is gracious and long-suffering, for without the idea of unchangeableness in the character of the deity, doubt would take the place of faith, but with the idea that he changes not, faith lays hold upon the excellencies in his character with unshaken confidence, believing he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that his course is one eternal round. 
And again, the idea that he is a God of truth and cannot lie is equally as necessary to the exercise of faith in him as the idea of his unchangeableness. For without the idea that he was a God of truth and could not lie, the confidence necessary to be placed in his word in order to the exercise of faith in him could not exist. But having the idea that he is not man, that he cannot lie, it gives power to the minds of men to exercise faith in him. But it is also necessary that men should have an idea that he is no respecter of persons. For with the idea of all the other excellencies in his character and this one wanting, men could not exercise faith in him. Because if he were a respecter of persons, they could not tell whether their privileges were, nor how far they were authorized to exercise faith in him, or whether they were authorized to do it at all, but all must be confusion. But no sooner are the minds of men made acquainted with the truth on this point that he is no respecter of persons than they see that they have the authority by faith to lay a hold on eternal life, the richest boon of heaven, because God is no respecter of persons, and that every man in every nation has an equal privilege. And lastly, but not less important, to the exercise of faith in God is the idea that He is love. For with all the other excellencies in His character, without this one to influence them, they could not have such powerful dominion over the minds of men. But when the idea is planted in the mind that He is love, who cannot see the just ground that men of every nation, kindred and tongue, have to exercise faith in God so as to obtain eternal life. From the above description of the character of the deity, which is given him in the revelations to men, there is a sure foundation for the exercise of faith in him among every people, nation, and kindred from age to age and from generation to generation. Let us here observe that the foregoing is the character which is given of God in his revelations to the former day saints, and it is also the character which is given of him in his revelations to the latter day saints, so that the saints of former days and those of latter days are both alike in this respect, the latter day saints having as good grounds to exercise faith in God as the former day saints had, because the same character is given of him to both. Questions and Answers on the Foregoing Principles What was shown in the second lecture? It was shown how the knowledge of the existence of God came into the world. What is the effect of the idea of his existence among men? It lays the foundation for the exercise of faith in him. Is the idea of his existence in the first instance necessary in order for the exercise of faith in him? It is. How do you prove it? By the 10th chapter of Romans and 14th verse. How many things are necessary for us to understand respecting the deity and our relation to him in order that we may exercise faith in him for life and salvation. 3. What are they? First, that God does actually exist. Secondly, correct ideas of his character, his perfections and attributes. And thirdly, that the course which we pursue is according to his mind and will. Would the idea of any one or two of the above mentioned things enable a person to exercise faith in God? It would not, for without the idea of them all, faith would be imperfect and unproductive. Would an idea of these three things lay a sure foundation for the exercise of faith in God so as to obtain life and salvation? It would, for by the idea of these three things, faith could become perfect and fruitful, abounding in righteousness unto the praise and glory of God. 
How are we to be made acquainted with the before-mentioned things respecting the Deity and respecting ourselves? By revelation. Could these things be found out by any other means than by revelation? They cannot. How do you prove it? By the scriptures. Job 11, 7 through 9, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 11. What things do we learn in the revelations of God respecting his character? We learn the six following things. First, that he was God before the world was created and the same God that he was after was created. Secondly, that he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abundant and goodness, and that he was so from everlasting and will be so to everlasting. Thirdly, that he changes not, neither is there variableness with him, and that his course is one eternal round. Fourthly, that he is a God of truth and cannot lie. Fifthly, that he is no respecter of persons. And sixthly, that he is love. Where do you find the revelations which give us this idea of the character of the deity? In the Bible and Book of Commandments, and they are quoted in the third lecture. What effect would it have on any rational being not to have an idea that the Lord was God, the creator and upholder of all things? It would prevent him from exercising faith in him unto life and salvation. Why would it prevent him from exercising faith in God? Because he would be as a heathen, not knowing, but there might be a greater and more powerful than he, and thereby he being prevented from fulfilling his promises. Does this idea prevent his doubt? It does. For persons having this idea are enabled thereby to exercise faith without this doubt. Is it not also necessary to have the idea that God is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and full of goodness? It is. Why is it necessary? Because of the weakness and imperfections of human nature and the great frailties of man. For such is the weakness of man, and such is his frailties, that he is liable to sin continually. And if God were not long-suffering and full of compassion, gracious and merciful and of a forgiving disposition, men would be cut off from before him, in consequence of which he would be in continual doubt and could not exercise faith. For where doubt is, there faith has no power. But by man's believing that God is full of compassion and forgiveness, long-suffering and slow to anger, he can exercise faith in him and overcome doubt, so as to be exceedingly strong. Is it not equally as necessary that man should have an idea that God changes not, neither is there variableness within him, in order to exercise faith in him unto life and salvation? It is because without this, he would not know how soon the mercy of God might change unto cruelty. His long-suffering unto rashness is love unto hatred, and in consequence of which doubt men would be incapable of exercising faith in him. But having the idea that he is unchangeable, man can have faith in him continually, believing that he was yesterday, he is today, and will be forever. Is it not necessary also for men to have an idea that God is a being of truth before they can have a perfect faith in him? It is, for unless men have this idea, they cannot place confidence in his word, and not being able to place confidence in his word, they could not have faith in him. But believing that he is a God of truth and that his word cannot fail, their faith can rest in him without doubt. Could man exercise faith in God so as to obtain eternal life unless he believed that God was no respecter of persons? He could not, because without this idea he could not certainly know that it was his privilege so to do. In consequence of this doubt, his faith could not be sufficiently strong to save him. Would it be possible for a man to exercise faith in God so as to be saved 
unless he had an idea that God was love? He could not, because man could not love God unless he had an idea that God was love. And if he did not love God, he could not have faith in him. What is the description which the sacred writers gave of the character of the deity calculated to do? It is calculated to lay a foundation for the exercise of faith in him, as far as the knowledge extends among all people, tongues, languages, kindreds, and nations, and that from age to age and from generation to generation is the character which God has given of himself uniform? It is. In all his revelations, whether to the former day saints or to the latter day saints, so that they all have the authority to exercise faith in him and to expect by the exercise of their faith to enjoy the same blessings. Lectures on Faith, Fourth Lecture Having shown in the third lecture that correct ideas of the character of God are necessary in order to the exercise of faith in him unto life and salvation. And without correct ideas of his character, the minds of men could not have sufficient power with God to the exercise of faith necessary to the enjoyment of eternal life, and that correct ideas of his character lay a foundation as far as his character is concerned. For the exercise of faith so as to enjoy the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ, even that of eternal glory. We shall now proceed to show the connection that there is between correct ideas of the attributes of God and the exercise of faith in Him unto eternal life. Let us here observe that the real design which the God of heaven had in view in making the human family acquainted with His attributes was that they, through the ideas of the existence of His attributes, might be enabled to exercise faith in Him, and through the exercise of faith in Him might obtain eternal life, for without the idea of the existence of the attributes which belong to God, the minds of men could not have the power to exercise faith in Him so as to lay hold upon eternal life. The God of heaven, understanding most perfectly the constitution of human nature and the weakness of men, knew that it was necessary to be revealed, and what ideas must be planted in their minds in order that they might be enabled to exercise faith in him unto eternal life. Having said so much, we shall proceed to examine the attributes of God as set forth in his revelations to the human family, and to show how necessary correct ideas of its attributes are to enable men to exercise faith in him. For without these ideas being planted in the minds of men, it would be out of the power of any person or persons to exercise faith in God so as to obtain eternal life. So that the divine communications made to men in the first instance were designed to establish in their minds the ideas necessary to enable them to exercise faith in God, and through this means to be partakers of His glory. We have, in the revelations which he has given unto the human family, the following account of his attributes. First, knowledge. Acts 15, 18. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Secondly, faith or power, Hebrews 11:3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, Genesis 1:1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, Isaiah 14, 24, and 27. The Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. 
and as I have purposed, so shall it stand. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? Thirdly, justice. Psalm 89.14 Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Isaiah 45.21 Tell ye, and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. Zephaniah 3, 5 The just Lord is in the midst thereof. Zechariah 9, 9 Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, thy King cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. Fourthly, judgment. Psalm 89, 14. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Psalm 9, 7. But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. Psalm 9, 16. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. Fifthly, mercy. Psalm 89, 14. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Exodus 34, 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. Nehemiah 9, 17. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful. And sixthly, truth. Psalm 89, 14. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Exodus 34, 6. Long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. Psalm 31, 5. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. By a little reflection, it will be seen that the idea of the existence of these attributes in the deity is necessary to enable any rational being to exercise faith in him. For without the idea of the existence of these attributes in the deity, men could not exercise faith in him for life and salvation. Seeing that without the knowledge of all things, God would not be able to save any portion of his creatures. For it is by reason of the knowledge which he has of all things from the beginning to the end that enables him to give that understanding to his creatures, by which they are made partakers of eternal life. And if it were not for the idea existing in the minds of men that God had all knowledge, it would be impossible for them to exercise faith in him. And it is not less necessary that men should have the idea of the existence of the attribute power in the deity. For unless God had power over all things and was able by his power to control all things and thereby deliver his creatures who put their trust in him, from the power of all beings that might seek their destruction, whether in heaven, on earth, or in hell, men could not be saved. But with the idea of the existence of this attribute planted in the mind, men feel as though they had nothing to fear who put their trust in God, believing that he has power to save all who come to him to the very uttermost. It is also necessary, in order to the exercise of faith in God unto life and salvation, that men should have the idea of the existence of the attribute justice in him. For without the idea of the existence of the attribute justice in the deity, men could not have confidence sufficient to place themselves under his guidance and direction, for they would be filled with fear and doubt, lest the judge of all the earth would not do right and thus fear or doubt existing in the mind would preclude 
the possibility of the exercise of faith in Him for life and salvation. But when the idea of the existence of that attribute, justice, in the deity is fairly planted in the mind, it leaves no room for doubt to get into the heart, and the mind is enabled to cast itself upon the Almighty without fear and without doubt, and with the most unshaken confidence, believing that the judge of all the earth will do right. It is also of equal importance that men should have the idea of the existence of the attribute judgment in God, in order that they may exercise faith in Him for life and salvation. For without the idea of the existence of this attribute in the deity, it would be impossible for men to exercise faith in Him for life and salvation, seeing that it is through the exercise of this attribute that the faithful in Christ Jesus are delivered out of the hands of those who seek their destruction. For if God were not to come out in swift judgment against the workers of iniquity and the powers of darkness, His saints could not be saved. For it is by judgment that the Lord delivers His saints out of the hands of all their enemies and those who reject the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But no sooner is the idea of the existence of this attribute planted in the minds of men than it gives power to the mind for the exercise of faith and gives confidence in God, and they are enabled by faith to lay hold upon the promises which are set forth before them and wade through all the tribulations and afflictions to which they are subjected by reason of the persecution from those who know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, believing that in due time the Lord will come out in swift judgment against their enemies, and they shall be cut off from before him, and that in his own due time he will bear them off conquerors and more than conquerors in all things. And again, it is equally important that men should have the idea of the existence of the attribute, mercy, in the deity, in order to exercise faith in Him for life and salvation. For without the idea of the existence of this attribute in the deity, the spirits of the saints would faint in the midst of their tribulations, afflictions, and persecutions, which they have to endure for righteousness' sake. But when the idea of the existence of this attribute is once established in the mind, it gives life and energy to the spirits of the saints, believing that the mercy of God will be poured out upon them in the midst of their afflictions, and that He will be compassionate to them in their sufferings, and that the mercy of God will lay hold of them and secure them in the arms of His love, so that they will receive a full reward for all their sufferings. And lastly, but not less important to the exercise of faith in God, is the idea of the existence of the attribute truth, in him. For without the idea of the existence of this attribute, the mind of man could have nothing upon which it could rest with certainty. All would be confusion and doubt. But with the idea of the existence of this attribute in the deity in the mind, all the teachings, instructions, promises, and blessings become realities, and the mind is enabled to lay hold of them with certainty and confidence believing that these things and all that the Lord has said shall be fulfilled in their time, and that all the cursings, denunciations, and judgments pronounced upon the heads of the unrighteous will also be executed in due time of the Lord. And by reason of the truth and veracity of Him, the mind beholds its deliverance and salvation as being certain. Let the mind once reflect sincerely and candidly upon the ideas of the existence of the before-mentioned attributes in the deity, and it will be seen that as far as his attributes are concerned, there is a sure foundation laid for the exercise of faith in him for life and salvation. For inasmuch as God possesses the attribute knowledge, he can make all things known to his saints necessary for their salvation. And as he possesses the attribute power, he is able thereby to deliver them from the power of all enemies. And seeing also that justice is an attribute of the deity, he will deal with them upon the principles of righteousness and equity. And a just reward will be granted unto them for all their afflictions and sufferings, 
for the truth's sake. And as judgment is an attribute of the deity also, his saints can have the most unshaken confidence that they will, in due time, obtain a perfect deliverance out of the hands of all their enemies and a complete victory over all those who have sought their hurt and destruction. And as mercy is also an attribute of the deity, his saints can have confidence that it will be exercised towards them. And through the exercise of that attribute towards them, comfort and consolation will be administered unto them abundantly amid all their afflictions and tribulations. And lastly, realizing that truth is an attribute of the deity, the mind is led to rejoice amid all its trials and temptations in hope of that glory which is to be brought at the revelation of Jesus Christ and in view of that crown which is to be placed upon the heads of the saints in the day when the Lord shall distribute rewards upon them and in prospect of that eternal weight of glory which the Lord has promised to bestow upon them when he shall bring them in the midst of his throne to dwell in his presence eternally. In view, then, of the existence of these attributes, the faith of the saints can become exceedingly strong, abounding in righteousness unto the praise and glory of God, and can exert his mighty influence in searching after wisdom and understanding until it has obtained a knowledge of all things that pertain to life and salvation. Such then is the foundation which is laid through the revelation of the attributes of God for the exercise of faith in Him for life and salvation. And seeing that these are attributes of the deity, they are unchangeable, being the same yesterday, today, and forever, which gives to the minds of the Latter-day Saints the same power and authority to exercise faith in God which the former-day saints had so that all the saints in this respect have been, are, and will be alike until the end of time. For God never changes, therefore his attributes and character remain forever the same. And as it is through the revelation of these that a foundation is laid for the exercise of faith in God unto life and salvation. The foundation, therefore, for the exercise of faith was, is, and ever will be the same, so that all men have had and will have an equal privilege. Questions and Answers on the Foregoing Principles What was shown in the third lecture? It was shown that correct ideas of the character of God are necessary in order to exercise faith in Him unto life and salvation, and that without correct ideas of His character, Men could not have power to exercise faith in him unto life and salvation. But that correct ideas of his character, as far as his character was concerned, and the exercise of faith in him, lay a sure foundation for the exercise of it. What object had the God of heaven in revealing his attributes to men? that through an acquaintance with his attributes they might be enabled to exercise faith in him so as to obtain eternal life. Could men exercise faith in God without an acquaintance with his attributes so as to be enabled to lay hold of eternal life? They could not. What account is given of the attributes of God in his revelations? First, knowledge. Secondly, faith or power, thirdly, justice, fourthly, judgment, fifthly, mercy, and sixthly, truth. Where are the revelations to be found which give this revelation of the attributes of God? In the Old and New Testaments, and they are quoted in the fourth lecture, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth paragraphs. Is the idea of the existence of these attributes in the deity necessary in order to enable any rational being to exercise faith in him unto life and salvation? It is. How do you prove it? By the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th paragraphs in this lecture.
does the idea of the existence of these attributes in the deity as far as his attributes are concerned enable a rational being to exercise faith in him unto life and salvation? It does. How do you prove it? By the 17th and 18th paragraphs. Have the Latter-day Saints as much authority given them through the revelation of the attributes of God to the exercise of faith in Him as the former day saints had? They have. How do you prove it? By the 19th paragraph of this lecture. Let the student turn and commit these paragraphs to memory. Lectures on Faith, 5th Lecture in our former lectures, we treated of the being, character, perfections, and attributes of God. What we mean by perfections is the perfections which belong to all the attributes of His nature. We shall in this lecture speak of the Godhead. We mean the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are two personages who constitute the great, matchless, and governing and supreme power over all things by whom all things were created and made and that are created and made whether visible or invisible whether in heaven on earth or in the earth under the earth or throughout the immensity of space they are the father and the son the father being a personage of spirit glory and power possessing all perfection and fullness the son who was in the bosom of the father a personage of tabernacle, made or fashioned like unto man, or being in the form and likeness of man, or rather, man was formed after his likeness, and in his image. He is also the express image and likeness of the personage of the Father, possessing all the fullness of the Father, or the same fullness with the Father, being begotten of him, and ordained from before the foundation of the world to be a propitiation for the sins of all those who should believe on his name, and is called the Son because of the flesh, and descended in suffering below that which man can suffer, or in other words, suffered greater sufferings, and was exposed to more powerful contradictions than any man can be. But notwithstanding all this, he kept the law of God and remained without sin, showing thereby that it is in the power of man to keep the law and remain also without sin, and also that by him a righteous judgment might come upon all flesh, and that all who walk not in the law of God may justly be condemned by the law and have no excuse for their sins. And he being the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, and having overcome, received a fullness of the glory of the Father, possessing the same mind with the Father, which mind is the Holy Spirit, that bears record of the Father and the Son, and these three are one, or in other words, these three constitute the great matchless governing and supreme power over all things, by whom all things were created and made that were created and made. And these three constitute the Godhead and are one, the Father and the Son, possessing the same mind, the same wisdom, glory, power, and fullness, filling all in all. The Son being filled with the fullness of the mind, glory, and power, or in other words, the Spirit, glory, and power of the Father, possessing all knowledge and glory, and the same kingdom, sitting at the right hand of power and in the express image and likeness of the Father, mediator for man, being filled with the fullness of the mind of the Father, or in other words, the Spirit of the Father, which Spirit is shed forth upon all who believe on His name and keep His commandments. And all those who keep His commandments shall grow up from grace to grace and become heirs of the heavenly kingdom and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, possessing the same mind, being transformed into the same image or likeness, even the express image of Him who fills all in all, 
being filled with the fullness of his glory and become one in him, even as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. From the foregoing account of the Godhead, which is given in his revelations, the saints have a sure foundation laid for the exercise of faith unto life and salvation through the atonement and mediation of Jesus Christ, by whose blood they have a forgiveness of sins, and also a sure reward laid up for them in heaven, even that of partaking of the fullness of the Father and the Son through the Spirit. As the Son partakes of the fullness of the Father through the Spirit, so the saints are, by the same Spirit, to be partakers of the same fullness, to enjoy the same glory. For as the Father and the Son are one, so in like manner the saints are to be one in them. Through the love of the Father, the mediation of Jesus Christ, and the gift of the Holy Spirit, they are to be heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Questions and answers on the foregoing principles. Of what do the foregoing lectures treat? Of the being, perfections, and attributes of the deity. What are we to understand by the perfections of the deity, the perfections which belong to his attributes? How many personages are there in the Godhead? Two the Father, and Son. How do you prove that there are two personages in the Godhead? By the scriptures, Genesis 1, 26. Also, Lecture 2, 6. And I, God, said unto mine only begotten, which was with me from the beginning, let us make in our image after our likeness, and it was so. Genesis 3, 22. And I, the Lord God, said unto mine only begotten, behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. John 17, 5 And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. What is the Father? He is a personage of glory and of power. How do you prove that the Father is a personage of glory and power? Isaiah 60, 19 the sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee. But the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. 1 Chronicles 29, 11. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory. Psalm 29, 3. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. Psalm 79, 9. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of thy name. Romans 1, 23. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. Secondly, of power. 1 Chronicles 29, 11. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory. Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Deuteronomy 4, 37. And because he loved thy fathers, therefore he chose their seed after them and brought thee out in his sight with his mighty power. 2 Samuel 22:33 God is my strength and power. Job 26, commencing with the 7th verse to the end of the chapter. He stretched out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. He bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them. He holdeth back the face of his throne and spreadeth his cloud upon it. He hath compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. He divideth the sea with his power, and by his understanding he smiteth through the proud. By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens. 
His hand hath formed the crooked serpent. Lo, these are parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? What is the sun? First, he is a personage of tabernacle. How do you prove it? John 14, 9 through 11. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Shew us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works, believeth me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Secondly, and being a personage of tabernacle, was made or fashioned like unto man, or being in the form and likeness of man. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Hebrews 2, 14 and 16. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Thirdly, he is also in the likeness of the personage of the Father. Hebrews 1, 1 1-3 God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Again, Philippians 2, 5 through 6. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Was it by the Father and the Son that all things were created and made that were created and made? It was. Colossians 1, 15 through 17. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Genesis 1.1 1, 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Hebrews 1.2 God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Does he possess the fullness of the Father? He does. Colossians chapter 1, 19, chapter 2, 9. For it pleased the Father that in him should the fullness dwell. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Ephesians 1, 23. Which is his, Christ's, body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Why was he called the Son? Because of the flesh. Luke 1, 35. That holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he, John, saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighted upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Was he ordained of the Father? 
from before the foundation of the world to be a propitiation for the sins of all those who should believe on his name. He was. 1 Peter 1, 18-20 For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Revelation 13.8 And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, meaning the beast, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 1 Corinthians 2.7 But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Do the Father and the Son possess the same mind? They do. John 5.30 I, Christ, can of mine own self do nothing, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. John 6.38 For I, Christ, came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. John 10.30 I, Christ, and my Father are one. What is this mind? The Holy Spirit. John 15.26 But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, Christ, Galatians 4, 6. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts. Do the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit constitute the Godhead? They do. Do the believers in Christ Jesus, through the gift of the Spirit, become one with the Father and the Son? as the Father and the Son are one, they do. John 17, 20, and 21. Neither pray I for these, the apostles, alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe, that thou hast sent me. Does the foregoing account of the Godhead lay a sure foundation for the exercise of faith in him unto life and salvation? It does. How do you prove it? By the third paragraph of this lecture. Let the student commit these paragraphs to memory. Lectures on Faith, 6th lecture. Having treated in the preceding lectures of the ideas of the character, perfections, and attributes of God, we next proceed to treat of the knowledge which persons must have that the course of life which they pursue is according to the will of God, in order that they may be enabled to exercise faith in Him unto life and salvation. This knowledge supplies an important place in revealed religion for it was by reason of it that the ancients were enabled to endure as seeing him who is invisible. An actual knowledge to any person that the course of life which he pursues is according to the will of God is essentially necessary to enable him to have that confidence in God without which no person can obtain eternal life. It was this that enabled the ancient saints to endure all their afflictions and persecutions and to take joyfully the spoiling of their goods, knowing, not believing merely, that they had a more enduring substance. Hebrews 10, 34. Having the assurance that they were pursuing a course which was agreeable to the will of God, they were enabled to take 
not only the spoiling of their goods and the wasting of their substance joyfully, but also to suffer death in its most horrid forms, knowing, not merely believing, that when this earthly house of their tabernacle was dissolved, they had a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 5, 1. Such was and always will be the situation of the saints of God, that unless they have an actual knowledge that the course they are pursuing is according to the will of God, they will grow weary in their minds and faint. For such has been and always will be the opposition in the hearts of unbelievers and those that know not God against the pure and unadulterated religion of heaven, the only thing that ensures eternal life, that they will persecute to the uttermost all that worship God according to his revelations, receive the truth in the love of it, and submit themselves to be guided and directed by his will, and drive them to such extremities that nothing short of an actual knowledge of their being the favorites of heaven and of their having embraced that order of things which God has established for the redemption of man will enable them to exercise that confidence in him necessary for them to overcome the world and obtain that crown of glory which is laid up for them that fear God. For a man to lay down his all, his character and reputation, his honor and applause, his good name among men, his houses, his lands, his brothers, and his sisters, his wife and children, and even his own life also, counting all things but filth and dross for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, requires more than mere belief or supposition that he is doing the will of God, but an actual knowledge, realizing that when these sufferings are ended, he will enter into eternal rest and be a partaker of the glory of God. For unless a person does know that he is walking according to the will of God, it would be offering an insult to the dignity of the Creator were he to say that he would be a partaker of his glory when he should be done with the things of this life. But when he has this knowledge, and most assuredly knows that he is doing the will of God, his confidence can be equally strong that he will be a partaker of the glory of God. Let us here observe that a religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things never has the power sufficient to produce the faith necessary unto life and salvation. For from the first existence of man, the faith necessary unto the enjoyment of life and salvation never could be obtained without the sacrifice of all earthly things. It was through this sacrifice and this only that God has ordained that men should enjoy eternal life. And it is through the medium of the sacrifice of all earthly things that men do actually know that they are doing the things that are well-pleasing in the sight of God. When a man has offered in sacrifice all that he has for the truth's sake, not even withholding his life and believing before God that he has been called to make this sacrifice because he seeks to do his will, he does know most assuredly that God does and will accept his sacrifice and offering, and that he has not nor will not seek his face in vain. Under these circumstances, then, he can obtain the faith necessary for him to lay hold on eternal life. It is in vain for persons to fancy themselves that they are heirs with those or can be heirs with them who have offered their all in sacrifice, and by this means obtained faith in God and favor with him so as to obtain eternal life, unless they, in like manner, offer unto him the same sacrifice, and through that offering obtain the knowledge that they are accepted of him. It was in offering sacrifices that Abel, the first martyr, obtained knowledge that he was accepted of God. And from the days of righteous Abel to the present time, the knowledge that men have that they are accepted in the sight of God is obtained by offering sacrifice. And in the last days before the Lord comes, he is to gather together his saints who have made a covenant with him by sacrifice. 
Psalm 53 through 5. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous around about him. And he shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Those then who make the sacrifice will have the testimony that their course is pleasing in the sight of God. And those who have this testimony will have faith to lay hold on eternal life and will be enabled through faith to endure unto the end and receive the crown that is laid up for them that love the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who do not make the sacrifice cannot enjoy this faith because men are dependent upon this sacrifice in order to obtain this faith. Therefore, they cannot lay hold upon eternal life because the revelations of God do not guarantee unto them the authority to do so. And without this guarantee, faith could not exist. All the saints of whom we have account and all the revelations of God, which are extent, obtained the knowledge which they had of their acceptance in his sight through the sacrifice which they offered unto him. And through the knowledge thus obtained their faith becoming sufficiently strong to lay hold upon the promise of eternal life and to endure as seeing him who is invisible and were enabled through faith to combat the powers of darkness, contend against the wiles of the adversary, overcome the world, and obtain the end of their faith, even the salvation of their souls. But those who have not made this sacrifice to God do not know that the course which they pursue is well-pleasing in His sight. For whatever may be their belief or their opinion, it is a matter of doubt and uncertainty in their mind. And where doubt and uncertainty are, their faith is not, nor can it be. For doubt and faith do not exist in the same person at the same time. So, that persons whose minds are under doubts and fears cannot have unshaken confidence. And where unshaken confidence is not, their faith is weak. And where faith is weak, the persons will not be able to contend against all the opposition, tribulations, and afflictions which they will have to encounter in order to be heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And they will grow weary in their minds, and the adversary will have power over them and destroy them. This lecture is so plain, and the facts set forth so self-evident that it is deemed unnecessary to form a catechism upon it. The student is therefore instructed to commit the whole to memory. Lectures on Faith, 7th Lecture In the preceding lessons we treated of what faith was and of the object on which it rested, agreeable to our plan. We now proceed to speak of its effects. As we have seen in our former lectures that faith was the principle of action and power in all intelligent beings, both in heaven and on earth, it will not be expected that we shall, in a lecture of this description, attempt to unfold all its effects, neither is it necessary to our purpose to do so, for it would embrace all things in heaven and on earth, and encompass all the creations of God, with all their endless varieties for no world has yet been framed that was not framed by faith. Neither has there been an intelligent being on any of God's creations who did not get there by reason of faith as it existed in himself or in some other being. Nor has there been a change or a revolution in any of the creations of God, but it has been affected by faith. Neither will there be a change or a revolution unless it is affected in the same way in any of the vast creations of the Almighty, for it is by faith that the Deity works. Let us here offer some explanation in relation to faith, that our meaning may be clearly comprehended. We ask then, what are we to understand by a man's working by faith? We answer, we understand that when a man works by faith, he works by mental exertion instead of physical force. It is by words instead of exerting his physical powers. 
with which every being works when he works by faith. God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Joshua spake, and the greater lights, which God had created, stood still. Elijah commanded, and the heavens were stayed for the space of three years and six months, so that it did not rain. He again commanded, and the heavens gave forth rain. All this was done by faith, and the Savior says, If ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, say unto this mountain, Remove, and it will be removed. Or say unto the sycamore tree, Be ye plucked up, and be planted in the midst of the sea, and it shall obey you. Faith then works by words, and with these its mightiest works have been and will be performed. It surely will not be required of us to prove that this is the principle upon which all eternity has acted and will act. For every reflecting mind must know that it is by reason of this power that all the hosts of heaven perform their works of wonder, majesty, and glory. Angels move from place to place by virtue of this power. It is by reason of it that they are enabled to descend from heaven to earth. And were it not for this power of faith, they could never be ministering spirits to them who should be heirs of salvation. Neither could they act as heavenly messengers, for they would be destitute of the power necessary to enable them to do the will of God. It is only necessary for us to say that the whole visible creation as it now exists is the effect of faith. It was faith by which it was framed, and it is by the power of faith that it continues in its organized form, and by which the planets move around their orbits and sparkle forth their glory. So then, faith is truly the first principle in the science of theology, and when understood, leads the mind back to the beginning and carries it forward to the end, or in other words, from eternity to eternity. As faith, then, is the principle by which the heavenly hosts perform their works, and by which they enjoy all their felicity, we might expect to find it set forth in a revelation from God as the principle upon which his creatures here below must act in order to obtain the felicities enjoyed by the saints in the eternal world, and that when God would undertake to raise up men for the enjoyment of himself, he would teach them the necessity of living by faith and the impossibility there was of their enjoying the blessedness of eternity without it, seeing that all the blessings of eternity are the effects of faith. Therefore, it is said, and appropriately too, that without faith it is impossible to please God. If it should be asked, why is it impossible to please God without faith? The answer should be, because without faith it is impossible for men to be saved. And as God desires the salvation of men, he must of course desire that they should have faith. And he could not be pleased unless they had, or else he could be pleased with their destruction. From this we learn that the many exhortations which have been given by inspired men to those who had received the word of the Lord to have faith in him were not mere commonplace matters but were for the best of all reasons, and that was because without it there was no salvation, neither in this world nor in that which is to come. When men begin to live by faith, they begin to draw near to God. And when faith is perfected, they are like him, and because he is saved, they are saved also, for they will be in the same situation he is in, because they have come to him, and when he appears, they shall be like him, for they will see him as he is. As all the visible creation is an effect of faith, so is salvation also. We mean salvation in its most extensive latitude of interpretation, whether it is temporal or spiritual. In order to have this subject clearly set before the mind, let us ask what situation must a person be in in order to be saved, or what is the difference between a saved man and one who is not saved? We answer, from what we have before seen of the heavenly worlds, they must be persons who can work by faith 
and who are able, by faith, to be administering spirits to them who shall be heirs of salvation, and they must have faith to enable them to act in the presence of the Lord. Otherwise, they cannot be saved. And what constitutes the real difference between a saved person and one not saved is the difference in the degree of their faith. One's faith has become perfect enough to lay a hold upon eternal life, and the other's has not. But to be a little more particular, let's ask, where shall we find a prototype into whose likeness we may be assimilated, in order that we may be made partakers of life and salvation? Or, in other words, where shall we find a saved being? For if we can find a saved being, we may ascertain without much difficulty what all others must be in order to be saved. We think that it will not be a matter of dispute that two beings who are unlike each other cannot both be saved. For whatever constitutes the salvation of one will constitute the salvation of every creature which will be saved. And if we find one saved being in all existence, we may see that all others must be or else not be saved. We ask then, where is the prototype? Or where is the saved being? We conclude as to the answer of this question. There will be no dispute among those who believe the Bible that it is Christ. All will agree in this, that he is the prototype or the standard of salvation. Or in other words, that he is a saved being. And if we should continue our interrogation and ask how it is that he is saved, the answer would be because he is a just and holy being. And if he were anything different from what he is, he would not be saved. For his salvation depends on his being precisely what he is and nothing else. For if it were possible for him to change in the least degree, so sure would he fail of salvation and lose all his dominion, power and authority and glory, which constitute salvation. For salvation consists in the glory, authority, majesty, power, and dominion which Jehovah possesses, and in nothing else. And no being can possess it but himself, or one like him. Thus says John in his first epistle, third chapter, second and third verses. Beloved now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and every man that hath his hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Why purify themselves as he is pure? Because if they do not, they cannot be like him. The Lord said unto Moses, Leviticus 19.2, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy. For I, the Lord your God, am holy. And Peter says, First Epistle, first chapter, 15 and 16. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And the Savior says, Matthew 5:48, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. If any man should ask, why all these sayings? The answer is to be found from what is before quoted from John's epistle, that when he, the Lord, shall appear, the saints will be like him. And if they are not holy as he is holy, and perfect as he is perfect, they cannot be like him, for no being can enjoy his glory without possessing his perfections and holiness, no more than they could reign in his kingdom without his power. This clearly sets forth the propriety of the Savior's saying recorded in John's testimony, chapter 14, 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. This taken in connection with some of the sayings in the Savior's prayer recorded in the 17th chapter, gives great clearness to his expressions. He says in the 20th and 24th verses, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, 
that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and thou hast loved them, and thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. All these sayings put together give as clear an account of the state of the glorified saints as language could give. The works that Jesus had done they were to do, and greater works than those which he had done among them should they do, and that because he went to the Father. He does not say that they should do these works in time, but they should do greater works because he went to the Father. He says in the 24th verse, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. These sayings taken in connection make it very plain that the greater works which those that believed on his name were to do were to be done in eternity, where he was going and where they should behold his glory. He said in another part of his prayer that he desired of his Father that those who believed on him should be one in him as he and the Father were one in each other. Neither pray I for these, the apostles, alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, that is, they who believe on him through the apostles' words, as well as the apostles themselves, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. What language can be plainer than this? The Savior surely intended to be understood by his disciples, and he so spake that they might understand him. For he declares to his Father, in language not to be easily mistaken, that he wanted his disciples, even all of them, to be as himself and the Father. For as he and the Father were one, so they might be one with them. And what is said in the 22nd verse is calculated to more firmly establish this belief. If it needs anything to establish it, he says, And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, as much to say that unless they have the glory which the Father had given him, they could not be one with them. For he says, He had given them the glory that the Father had given him, that they might be one, or in other words, to make them one. This fills up the measure of information on this subject and shows most clearly that the Savior wished his disciples to understand that they were to be partakers with him in all things, not even his glory accepted. It is scarcely necessary here to observe what we have previously noticed, that the glory which the Father and the Son have is because they are just and holy beings, and that if they were lacking in one attribute or perfection, which they have, that the glory that they have never could be enjoyed by them, for it requires them to be precisely what they are in order to enjoy it. And if the Savior gives this glory to any others, he must do it in the very way set forth in his prayer to his Father, by making them one with him as he and the Father are one. In so doing, he would give them the glory which the Father has given him, and when his disciples are made one with the Father and the Son, as the Father and the Son are one, who cannot see the propriety of the Savior's saying, The works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. These teachings of the Savior most clearly show unto us the nature of salvation, and what he proposed unto the human family when he proposed to save them, 
that he proposed to make them like unto himself, and he was like the Father, the great prototype of all saved beings, and for any portion of the human family to be assimilated into their likeness is to be saved, and to be unlike them is to be destroyed, and on this hinge turns the door of salvation. Who cannot see, then, that the salvation is the effect of faith? For, as we have previously observed, all the heavenly beings work by this principle, and it is because they are able so to do that they are saved, for nothing but this could save them. And this is the lesson which the God of heaven, by the mouth of all his holy prophets, has been endeavoring to teach to the world. Hence, we are told that without faith it is impossible to please God, and that salvation is of faith, that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. Romans 4.16 And that Israel, who followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness, wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. Romans 9, 32. And Jesus said unto the man who brought his son to him, to get the devil who tormented him cast out. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Mark 9, 23. These, with a multitude of other scriptures, which might be quoted plainly, set forth the light in which the Savior, as well as the former day saints, viewed the plan of salvation. That it was a system of faith. It begins with faith and continues by faith. And every blessing which is obtained in relation to it is the effect of faith, whether it pertains to this life or that which is to come. To this all the revelations of God bear witness. If there were children of promise, they were the effects of faith, not even the Savior of the world accepted. Blessed is she that believeth, saith Elizabeth to Mary, when she went to visit her. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Luke 1.45 Nor was the birth of John the Baptist the less a matter of faith. For in order that his father Zacharias might believe, he was struck dumb. And through the whole history of the scheme of life and salvation, it is a matter of faith. Every man receiveth according to his faith. According to his faith was, so were his blessings and privileges, and nothing was withheld from him when his faith was sufficient to receive it. He could stop the mouths of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, wax valiant in fight, and put to flight the armies of the aliens. Women could, by their faith, receive their dead children to life again. In a word, there is nothing impossible with them who had faith. All things were in subjection to the former day saints according as their faith was. By their faith they could obtain heavenly visions and a ministering of angels have knowledge of the spirits of just men made perfect, of the general assembly and church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, of God the judge of all, of Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and become familiar with the third heavens. See and hear things which were not only unutterable, but were unlawful to utter. Peter, in view of the power of faith, second epistle of Peter, first chapter, second and third verses, says to the former day saints, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. In the first epistle of Peter, first chapter, third to fifth verses, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, 
and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. These sayings put together show the apostles' views most clearly so as to admit of no mistake on the mind of any individual. He says that all things that pertain to life and godliness were given unto them through the knowledge of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And if the question is asked, how were they to obtain the knowledge of God? For there is a great difference between believing in God and knowing Him. Knowledge implies more than faith. And notice that all things that pertain to life and godliness were given through the knowledge of God. The answer is given. Through faith they were to obtain this knowledge. And having power by faith to obtain the knowledge of God, they could with it obtain all other things which pertain to life and godliness. By these sayings of the apostles, we learn that it was by obtaining a knowledge of God that men got the knowledge of all things which pertain to life and godliness. And this knowledge was the effect of faith, so that all things which pertain to life and godliness are the effects of faith. From this we may extend as far as any circumstances may require, whether on earth or in heaven, and we will find it the testimony of all inspired men, or heavenly messengers, that all things that pertain to life and godliness are the effects of faith and nothing else. All learning, wisdom, and prudence fail, and everything else is a means of salvation but faith. This is the reason that the fishermen of Galilee could teach the world, because they sought by faith, and by faith obtained. And this is the reason that Paul counted all things but filth and dross. What he formerly called his gain, he called his loss. Yea, and he counted all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus the Lord. Philippians 3, 7-10 because to obtain the faith by which he could enjoy the knowledge of Christ Jesus, the Lord, he had to suffer the loss of all things. This is the reason that the former day saints knew more and understood more of heaven and of heavenly things than all others beside. Because this information is the effect of faith to be obtained by no other means. And this is the reason that men, as soon as they lose their faith, run into strifes, contentions, darkness, and difficulties. For the knowledge which tends to life disappears with faith, but returns when faith returns. For when faith comes, it brings its train of attendants with it. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, gifts, wisdom, knowledge, miracles, healings, tongues, interpretation of tongues, etc. All these appear when faith appears on the earth and disappear when it disappears from the earth. For these are the effects of faith and always have attended and always will attend it. For where faith is, there will the knowledge of God be also. With all things which pertain thereto, revelations, visions, and dreams, as well as every necessary thing, in order that the possessors of faith may be perfected and obtain salvation, for God must change, otherwise faith will prevail with him, and he who possesses it will, through it, obtain all necessary knowledge and wisdom until he shall know God and the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, whom to know is eternal life. Amen. Have you ever desired to live the fullness of the gospel? Do you look forward to building the city of the New Jerusalem? If so, we invite you to gather with us and establish Zion. A final gathering has begun, bringing Latter-day Saints together to establish consecrated communities, build temples, and keep all the commandments of God. If you will allow the Spirit to work in you, you will come to know that this is the work of God. If you have a desire to serve God, then I exhort you to pray fervently to know if this gathering preparatory to the establishment of the New Jerusalem 
is the place God wants you and your family to gather and labor for His kingdom. For further information, visit www.christchurchthebranch.org or contact the missionaries at right.branch at gmail.com or call 1-801-769-6279. This has been a Christ Church The Branch audio production. May God bless you and keep you. Amen.